What's up, traders? Anthony Crudelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. Welcome to today's panel on trading and high volatility with more at Askar, Joe Fami, and Brian Lund. We will go over ways to take advantage of high volatility. We'll also be taking your questions and comments throughout the discussion in the YouTube chat. So please put them in there. And I see already people are wishing Morad a happy birthday. We'll get to that in just a second. We bring Morad on. This podcast is sponsored by EdgeClear. Diversify your trading business with EdgeQX. EdgeClear offers a fully automated and fully transparent quantitative trading program. EdgeClear is excited to offer to their members this new automated strategy with full transparency to you, the trader. Quant trading has never looked better. More details at edgeclear.com slash edgeqx. I am going to bring in the boys now. Let's go. We've got everybody here. What's up, guys? Hey. hey. Thanks for having us on. Well, it's great to see all of you guys. First off, happy birthday, Morad. I know it was yesterday. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it back up. <laughs> <laughs> So, Joe and Brian, first time to the show. Love both of your guys' work. I mean, I, I go back to following you guys like on the stock to Twitter days. I mean, before I even got to Twitter. So, it's been a long time coming. I'm really excited to have you guys here. I'm actually going to start with you guys today because, unless everyone's been living in a shell, right? They don't. We're talking about high volatility. We know the markets have been very volatile, and you two guys talk a lot, especially you, Joe. You've been doing a ton of great spaces on like what's happening in the market. So maybe we'll just start with you. And say, you know, Joe, we know there's high volatility. Everyone can see that. But kind of dig in deep a little bit and tell everybody why do you think we are moving as much as we are? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on. I'm honored and uh, I'm excited to hear from the other guests as well. Uh, bottom line is, I don't know if you can put a percentage on the reason for all this, but the market's been difficult this year because of the Fed. You know, just from a quick macro picture, there's a reason Marty's why came up with the expression, don't fight the Fed. Uh, after the pandemic, they were providing a lot of liquidity into the system through buying bonds, through keeping rates at zero, uh, just a lot of uh, equity friendly, accommodative environment. And that's really that one simple word is liquidity. It was very favorable after the pandemic and then at the end of last year into the beginning of this year the fed did the opposite they said they were going to stop buying bonds they said they were going to raise rates this year and possibly reduce their balance sheet which they have been doing slowly so bottom line is that uh, the reason we have higher volatility from a technical point of view when we're below the 50 day below the 200 day which are two traditionally strong areas of institutional support. The institutions are no longer supporting the markets because the Fed is taking liquidity out of the system, and that's why you don't want to fight the Fed. So that's sort of the overall macro reason because of the Fed taking liquidity out of the system, fighting inflation, the technicals are weaker, and that leads to a higher volatility environment. Brian, let's go to you. I mean, talk to everybody about what Joe's saying when they, he says there's lack of liquidity. I mean, like Morin and I, we're trading S&P futures a lot, NASDAQ. We go in there and it's just, you know, you could put an order in anywhere. It gets filled almost in a second. Sometimes I get scared it gets filled so fast because I feel like, you know, it, it may be wrong. But so it feels like there's a ton of obviously liquidity when it comes to that perspective because the market's moving around so much. But there's there's a deeper issue here, I think, that Joe's talking about when you say lack of liquidity. Maybe you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I usually defer to guys like Joe when it comes to the macro picture, because as a trader, I just, you know, I'm not smart enough to figure all that out. And not only that, but all the macro is just very subjective. Like, I don't know how what the Fed's doing today, tomorrow, next week helps me make money today, tomorrow or next week. Um, so, you know, I follow the macro stuff from a uh, 30,000 foot perspective so I can talk about it at cocktail parties and on spaces. But I don't really get into that. I can tell you, you know, from a trader, from a from a, a price first perspective, you know, we had to see some sort of um, reversion to the mean based upon what we saw last year. I think last year we had something like 70 record high closes. We, we didn't have more than 33 trading days without a new high. That's unsustainable. So from a price standpoint, this this sort of action makes perfect sense. And then I just defer to people like Joe to explain it from a macro standpoint. 
Real quick, Moria, before I go to you, because I think you and I will we'll talk a lot about what we're seeing on our side as well. Joe, I think that I want to talk a little bit more about the liquidity issues that you mentioned. Explain to everybody what that really means. Well, when the, I mean, again, I'm just sort of a macro tourist. I kind of have to follow it uh, just to, you know, for the overall picture. But when the Fed is lowering rates, it's good for borrowing. It's good for business. When interest rates are low, a lot of hedge funds can lever up uh, their books. So they might have a $10 billion AUM assets under management fund, but they might really be trading with 50 or 60 billion, like just long and short. So when rates go higher, a lot a lot of those funds have to delever and take a lot of that liquidity out of the system because the Fed, by raising rates, it, it's harder to borrow. It's harder to, uh, you know, lever up for a lot of the, what these funds are doing. So and just overall uh, with their balance sheet, they might not be selling the bonds, but they're letting a lot of them run off. So it's just less uh, liquidity in the system. So it's just something to pay attention to. Yeah. Morad, you, you and I are in the trenches every day in the futures. You know, what are you doing? And what is this like anything? I know you and I have seen a lot. I mean, what is your take on what's going on right now with this high volatility? Uh, I mean, it's elevated, but it's not something like we saw during the Lehman Brothers crash and ma many other shock events. Uh, although, you know, between the invasion of Ukraine, the energy crisis, um, the fact that the euro moved to parity, the fact that the British pound almost moved to parity, which still blows me away, like how did that happen? And, uh, and uh, the fact that they have to reverse course on their tax package. Now look, uh, Joe and Brian are swing traders. Uh, clearly, Joe is in a higher time frame than I am. I'm looking at today, but I don't ignore the macro picture because I feel like it just gives me some context. At the end of the day, it's price and volume is what dictates uh, the next setup. But overall, what I've been doing to answer your question directly is I, I'm a bit of a quant statistical type of trader and I track rotations, I track how the S&P uh, these days crude, I stay away from the NASDAQ, it is just far too, far too volatile, far too quick. I've been lobbying to move it back to point increments instead of tick increments or a quarter of a point increments because it's, it's crazy. But I'm looking at how it ebbs and flows and that determines the volatility for me. I know some people use ETRs, people use the VIX and so on to decide, you know, should I increase my bands? But I'm looking at the actual rotations on a day-to-day -day basis to see how it moved. Uh, you know, back to Joe's point, I think the, with, you know, the liquidity being reduced and so on, I don't know about you guys, but this last FOMC, the comments that were made and the flip-flop that happened on, in the conference where we went, we were hawkish, then we ended up dovish, and then we were kind of in the middle. I got absolutely crushed. I, I got a winner, and then I got absolutely crushed that day on this huge movement, and it kind of forces you to stand back and say, okay, I'm trading too tight. I need to expand my time frame. I'm not going to be a swing trader, but I need to expand my time frame. So the first thing I do is look at the rotations and expand my stops, expand my targets, and reduce side to size to compensate for the per trade risk versus my account, just to keep that steady. Yeah, I mean, let's go to you then, Brian. I mean, I think that's a great question. How do you adjust and adapt to this type of volatility? Well, first, uh, just jumping on that point about the volatility, like it doesn't feel as volatile as it should be. Like I, I felt a lot of um, fear uh, out there, but not really the pain uh, that you you would expect to see at some of these turns. Like I, I think the VIX should be much higher now. So so the volatility is really not where I think it should be. Uh, however, in a elevated volatility market, um, there's three things that I do. I, I look at the market in, in terms of always in constant contraction or expansion, right? There's either more people coming into the market, more money, more buyers, or there's people exiting the market. Usually it's when they're exiting the market is when you have a lot of selling, when volatility spikes. So during those times, 
I like to either expand or contract my trading. So if money's coming into the market, I'm expanding my trading in terms of my time frames, my frequency of trading and my uh, position sizing. Then I'm doing the opposite when volatility spikes. I'm trading, I'm being more selective in my trades because the market's giving me less opportunities. I'm trading smaller position size and I'm trading smaller time frames, meaning if I had my choice, I would be a swing trader. I think the, the balance between effort and return is always the sweet spot is swing trading, but you can't always hold overnight when you're getting these gap ups and gap downs. So those three different parameters kind of contracting the way that I'm trading in conjunction with the contraction of the market keeps me in balance and, and takes risk off the table for me. You know, it's interesting, Warren, it's funny, like you and I are short, more shorter term than they are. So when it gets busier, we trade smaller and expand our time time frame, right? You listen to Brian, who trades a little bit wider time frame, us, and he actually goes to a smaller time frame. It's funny yeah. how that happens. And he said right? less opportunities. I'm like, yes, more volatility, more trades. It, it's, it, I know. It's Isn't so that funny, funny? How I mean, there, we come there, to the middle. Yeah, I mean, there's, it just goes to show you there's such a wide variety of ways to approach the market, right? And everybody has to balance out what works for them uh, and not just their methodology, but like their, their personality. Like there's, you know, yeah. sometimes... Uh, that's the main factor. And I, I see a lot of traders that think that they should trade this way based upon what they read or what they saw or a movie or something, but that doesn't really true up with their inner personality. They don't know that. Right. And so there's this conflict. So I think you make a great point. There are so many different ways to approach it. Uh, maybe in a volatile market, someone's going to get more active. Maybe someone's going to get less active as long as it works for you. And you're, you're, you know, you're, you're turning your P and L to green. That's all that matters. No, yeah, absolutely. And more and I have done a ton of shows and we, we totally agree with that. I mean, I want to go to you, Joe. I think maybe your time frame is probably the longest out of all of us. Is that probably accurate? Yeah, that's probably accurate. Yeah. So for someone like you, who I think, you know, looks at things that, you know, in a, in a bigger picture uh, than we do. And how do you adjust for that? Because it's not like it's so easy for you to go real super short term time or shorter term time frame. You know, it's it's a little different. Yeah, no, I mean, to to sort of piggyback some of the points that were made, I, I think it is interesting that, uh, you know, I'm doing less in a higher volatility time frame where you guys might be doing more. And I think that just proves the point. There's a lot of different ways to approach the market. And I always encourage people to work on something that fits their, uh, to use Brian's word, personality, fits their investment objectives, fits with like their temperament and so forth. Um, and then if you don't have a personality, work on getting that first and then coming back. But the point is that the other point, a really quick that leads into the answer to this question is the point Brian made. I agree. Like, what does the macro do? What does the overall picture do to help you make money? What it does for me is it just helps me decide if I'm going to get aggressive and size up, maybe even go on margin. If we have a low interest rate environment, the Fed is pumping liquidity into the system. I'm going to step on the gas more. When they're taking that out of the system, how it adjusts for me is I'm going to uh, lighten my position size. And that kind of leads into your uh, question, Anthony, is the biggest thing I've done for swing trading is I've reduced position size because breakouts don't work in uh, corrective and bear markets because a lot of follow through sustained moves don't work in this type of market. So I'm just taking smaller position sizes and either one giving them a little bit more room or if you have a decent gain um i would take that quicker profit rather than like let's say i don't know i'm going for a 20 percent swing move over a few months on a stock if i get five or seven i might take that shorter knowing that you're probably not going to get follow through sustained moves because the weight of the market is holding a lot of these stocks back yeah you know more ed I'll go back to you because I think that, you know, one of the things that you and I talk a lot about is because we're more on the shorter term side, the first thing we always look at is like, where's our exit, right? And we realize that now in order for us to be able to stay into a trade, the stop's gotten wider, we have to trade smaller. So we're adjusting a contract size based upon that distance of stop, right? Um, and the targets have become a lot wider as well. But it, it's so much could happen in between. I guess, you know, every morning I know you do your morning um uh, I forget exactly. Trade or bite. Trade right. Yeah. How could I forget it? I've been watching it for years. But the what is the one thing that when you come in as a trader every day that helps you set the tone for how you're going to approach that day? Uh, I, I look at um, 
I didn't used to maybe 10 years ago, but I look at the overnight session and I look at or Globex, my overnight, that's not overnight everywhere, but I uh, look at the Globex session and there's a lot that that gives, right? It tells us what kind of a market we had overnight. Were we just chopping and balance? Were we forming a fat profile? Is it elongated? Is it trending? What kind of volume you know, I expect to come in? By the time the trader bite starts, which is 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, I expect the S&P to have traded somewhere around 170,000 to 200,000 200, contracts. Lately, it's been trading 400, 500,000. Uh, the range overnight is expected to be, statistically speaking, up to about 35 points of range. Um, and lately, it's been anywhere between 45 and 80 points so immediately that tells me that there's i need to i need to size down there's going to be a lot of interaction because it it flows over what we finish with flows into asia what they do flows into europe and then what europe does flows into the u.s because the news is impacting people don't you know sometimes people forget how small a planet it is and how interconnected we are so I come in with that uh, first, and then I look at what volume did, meaning, you know, we're aggressors, more uh, uh, um, active on the sell side, buy side, uh, what has price done, what is it saying, and I set up the context, and that's what I cover in that uh, morning live stream every day to set up the day, and then I set up my scenarios. Usually come in with five scenarios, and I wait for the market to confirm the scenario, and then I put on the trade. I just don't like to trade in the moment. Um, I prefer not to, I can, but I prefer not to. So that's the structure for me, and that's how I'm preparing myself for what's coming for the day. Yeah, it's funny. It's like each session is the reaction to the reaction to the reaction, right? I mean, that's just the world we live in right now. Yo, I'll go back to you, Brian. We're talking about how to trade in high volatility. When you come into the day or when you get ready for a trade setup, what are the things that you're looking at to determine how you should be trading in this high volatility? Well, first, let me just note that the market has rallied since we started talking. So I think that's a good omen. Uh, <laughs> keep, this, uh, keep this podcast going perpetually. Uh, so what I like to do is, it, I'll tell you, my trading has changed so much as I've gotten older. You know, um, there's a certain amount of energy, focus, uh, certain resources that you only have when you're younger. And as I've gotten older, I've tried to refine my process to make it a lot simpler, to, to be able to conserve my energy, not chase red herrings. And so the night before, I already know what stocks I'm going to be focused on. I've got a... a, a a watch list, a kill list, whatever you want to call it. And I very rarely deviate from that uh, during the next trading day. In fact, we were talking before we went live is that if you find me scalping uh, NASDAQ futures, that means I don't have any options and that's probably a bad place for me to be. I shouldn't be doing that. But one of the things that I do, and I think this is an underrated tool for people, is I've spent a lot of time over the last few years curating really good traders and good sources. So first of all, that took place on Twitter. So like I have a, a list of people that I really respect, who's, you know, people like Joe, like yourself. And so when I, yeah, that's right, Joe Fahmy. And so when I get up, uh, instead of looking at the news reports, look at the data, all stuff, I look at that curated list. It takes all the universe of information that's already happened overnight. And I'm, you know, I'm on the West Coast and it focuses it right here so I can just check it. And then the thing that um, this kind of a happy accident about a year and a half ago, I started my own discord. And so I've got so many really uh, good, focused, smart, intelligent traders and investors in there. I pop open the discord and I can just scroll back a couple of because uh, they're all East Coast. They're up before me uh, and I can get up to speed really quickly. So um, that's kind of how I, I get a, a real quick uh, overview on what's going on in the market, what the tone, the tenor is, and, and what I want to keep an eye on. Joe, for you, you know, you, you're, you're trading on the, on the bigger time frame that we talked about. I mean, what are you looking at that's setting up any trades? What are the things you're looking at right now? Yeah, no, it's uh, the other thing I want to stress is it's, um, you know, I know this is more futures talk, but for me, it's more of individual stocks. I'm more of a growth manager looking for individual stocks. So, you don't have maybe that leverage or time pressure and stuff that you might have with shorter term future moves. So I totally respect, you know, with futures, it's a different time frame. Um, with stocks, uh, I, because four out of five stocks move with the general direction of the markets, I'm all about probabilities. 
So when we're in a strong uptrend and the institutions are coming in there and there's not much sell volume and we're, you know, the, the 10 days above the 20, above the 50, 200, and it's a nice smooth trend, that's where those few times a year that the market presents those uptrends, that's where I do my best work. When we're in a downtrend like now, it's more of sitting out, curating lists, uh, you know, just it's kind of boring. It's just uh, more in defensive protection mode because for my style of growth stocks, breakouts, stocks that are moving with maybe higher PEs and, and, and multiples and all that, those don't really work in corrective markets. But you do have to keep in mind, you know, you do have to do something or keep get a, a feel for the market. So it's four things that I do is – Number one is I'm at least going to give myself a shot with some of the stronger names that are showing relative strength that are near highs, not the ones that are in severe downtrend. So at least with the number one, a universe of stocks that are holding up better. Number two is a smaller position size to help deal with the higher volatility environment. Number three is getting those strong entry points because uh, – uh, accommodative markets can forgive your mistakes when you chase um, something that's extended. You don't stop yourself out. A really friendly market will forgive those mistakes. In a corrective bear market like we've had this year, it is ruthless. It doesn't care about you. It'll chew you up and spit you out. So you have to make sure not to chase extended stocks, not to get sloppy with your entry points and so forth. So that's very, very important. And then the fourth one, of course, is manage risk. And that just doesn't mean like a cliche, like everyone says you got to manage risk, is sticking to your stops and not having an ego. So if you do buy something and you like a story or you like a stock and it goes against you and breaks certain moving averages, you're just going to have to, you know, accept that and, and make sure to, uh, you know, remove your ego from your, tr from your trading, as they say, and stick to your stop losses. You know, what's interesting to me is like you got two futures guys up top. You got two stock guys in the bottom. But what, what's important is, is that we're kind of all both feeding off of each other of what's happening in the market. Right. Because obviously we are trading the indexes. And so I kind of want to just see a little bit about what you two think about how much the futures or the indexes are are, are basically impacting your decision making in, in the terms of like individual stocks. So for example, if you think all of a sudden the Russell or the Dow or the NASDAQ or the S&P has hit a key area, does that make you start to look at stocks more or is it only based on the names? I guess I'm wondering how much do the indexes matter of what they're doing impact your trading? And maybe we'll just stay with Joe and go back to Brian. Yeah, for me, it's a great question. For me, it's the direction of the indexes. So I am paying attention to the indexes and the major ones. NASDAQ's my go-to, NASDAQ Composite, because it's a larger sample size, over 3,000 stocks, a larger volume sample size. I do look at the S&P, Russell, and Dow, but I, I mean, they all kind of work for the most part together. But it's the direction of the index. So if we are, again, in a nice uptrend, I'm paying attention to just daily volume on the overall index so if if we're in an uptrend that will lead me because you kind of need the wind at your back because like i said four out of five stocks move with the general direction of the market so if we have a nice uptrend you know you don't even have to be that good of a stock picker stuff is really going to work out if we're in a downtrend i've always said this i don't care how great the company is because some people are saying why are these companies down 20, 30, 50, 80 percent? It doesn't matter how great the company is. If the market's in a downtrend, the market doesn't care. And a really quick example, this is an extreme example. But in 2008 and 9, global financial crisis, housing crisis, Apple split adjusted went from 180 down to 70 dollars. And my point is that was while they were coming out with arguably two of the greatest products of our lifetime, which is the iPhone and the iPad. So my point is. They're coming out with innovative products and the stock still got hit 60 or 70 percent because the market didn't care when it's in a downtrend. No matter how great the company's doing, you're going to have a lower probability of success. So the direction of the market is more important to me to help me gravitate towards the stocks. Bry? 
Yeah, I mean, Joe makes a great point. Is I, I have no interest in being that hero guy that's going to trade the one stock that's going against the overall trend. That just doesn't interest me. It's too much work. So I'm obviously looking from a macro standpoint, looking at the indexes. What direction are we going? Are we in a downtrend? Are we in an uptrend? Are we just basing sideways? And then one of the charts that I have up uh, as soon as the day starts is I put up the five-minute chart of the SPX, IWM, uh, Dow, and the, the Qs. And I like to mark the high and low of the previous day. That and the close are like key areas that I want to see how price reacts to that. And then I also have up the uh, the futures. I have uh, the 30 minute, the five minute, and the one minute. So you almost go, it's like a funnel. You know, you go from the indexes, you go to then to the five minute look at the indexes, and then you go to the, the uh, futures for a really a granular look. And you can see uh, you can see the trends change in those different time frames, and that will often inform uh, my decision. I want to go back real quick to something Joe said earlier um, about buying right. You know, a, a successful trade to me is a lot of little things done correctly. But the one thing that you can do that will help forgive other mistakes is buying right. That's the the key thing. So I always try to emphasize uh, to people that ask, like, if you can find that optimal spot for for buying a stock or a future, whatever, um, you'll have a lot more forgiveness if you make other mistakes along the way. So that's the key. You know, Morad, back to us, you know, on the future side, you know, my quick thing is when I look at this, what the stock guys are doing, it, when I go back to last year, uh, specifically, I saw the success us, you know, we don't know if it's success. We see everybody on Twitter talking about how well everyone's doing, right? But everybody's you make successful on Twitter. Don't you know yeah. that? What's that? Everybody's successful on Twitter. Everybody. 100% so, win right here. You can't lose. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible how good they are. Um, and I watched just to see kind of that, you know, what is the stock side doing? And that just emphasizes to me, you really just can't be short equities. Because if people, whether they're making money or not, you can see all these things that are working to the upside. So every time I know, I remember back in the pit, you know, my, my one buddy was really good. Uh, good friend of mine he used to say, he's be like, you know, he goes, look at at least when the market's going up, because we like to trade both sides. A lot of times we would struggle during those times. He goes, at least the portfolio is doing good to keep us in business. And then when the portfolio is going down, we're making more money because it's volatile. And it's just kind of always what it's been for me. I've tried to slowly, you know, make that better uh, on the averages. But so that's something that I look at with the stock guys. And even here in like today with Joe and Brian talk about how they're just not ready to step in they're in no hurry. And it also tells me that, you know, you don't have in going using Joe's words, the wind at your back. So for us, it's the opposite, right? If we, if we, the indexes are going and no one's buying the stocks, eventually they fade as well because they're not ready to step in. I mean, how do you see it? How do you use stocks? I mean, I'm, I'm, mon I have a, I, I keep it, it. There's, there's a point where in my time frame there's just way too much information, right? Yeah. You can go nuts following all these people and bringing in all these charts. So I, I do have a heat map up. So I want to know the biggest components of the S&P because that's my main product. And I want to know what they're doing. You know, yesterday I, I posted that uh, it looks like Christmas. It was all green, lit up green everywhere, you know. And then today it's all red. Well, earlier it was all red. It's kind of turning greenish, uh, at least in the energies. But, you know, that gives me an idea of what the sentiment is. I watched the New York Stock Exchange breadth just to see. I have some statistics on that. Once it crosses certain values, I know that it's kind of falling outside of what I would call normal or one standard deviation. Things like that kind of feed, feed me with a broader uh, underlying uh, view. But... So that's it for me in terms of stocks. Like I don't, some people put up a chart of Apple and Google, you know, the Fangman stocks and Fangman T or whatever. I don't do that. It's, it's too much information for my time frame. But I, I'm curious for both Brian and Joe, um, do, you, do you have a circumstance where you abandon individual issues? Uh, like you said, Joe, uh, relative strength. Do you have circumstances where you say, no, I don't want to pick certain uh, stocks. I'm just monitoring and trading on a swing basis, the SPY, the Diamonds, the Qs, uh, IWM. Do you ever go broad like that? Or 
do you always focus on individual issues and how they're performing versus the relative market? Well, it's a little bit of both. Coming off of lows when a lot of stocks have been, you know, really hit and really in downtrends and there's not a lot of strong setups or bases, technical bases, that's where I will use the index ETFs, whether it's SPY or Q or IWM, to give me broad exposure to the overall markets. And then after, if we start to bottom and the institutions start coming in, I look for those accumulation days on the up days that the institutions are consistently putting money to work because that could lead to a nice six to 12 week uptrend, for example. That's when I rotate into individual stocks. And I'm always paying attention to the ones that are holding up best that are closer to highs. In other words, if they survive the correction, they have a higher probability of success. A quick example going back to 0809 is we started to bottom in March of 09 and April we started to emerge and I would jump into an index ETF and then all of a sudden Netflix and Green Mountain Coffee started to appear on the new high list. You just had the S&P down 50% every energy name down, financial name down 80 or 90%. And you have these two stocks, Green Mountain Coffee and Netflix near new highs. So I rotated out of the uh, indexes and into individual names because they were in their early growth stages and, and, and went on to have huge gains. So the same thing I'll be doing now is as we hopefully try to bottom or whenever we do, use the indexes and then hopefully some usually repeats that you'll find some stocks that are acting well and shift over to individual stocks. Brian, what about you? You know, I had to laugh because uh, traders have their own language. And like when Joe was talking about Green Mountain Coffee, the first thing I thought was Einhorn, right? That was his play, David Einhorn's play, right? And uh, it's funny how we frame things, different parts of our trading uh, history. For me, uh, I don't really trade the uh, the like the Qs or uh, spies. Uh, they're not trading vehicles for me. But I think it's a great question because one of the things that people think about when they view a trader is, is binary. You either trade or you're long term. Like I'm a trader, but like I have long term accounts. Like I'm going to retire someday. I have kids that are going to college theoretically. And uh, so what I'll use the Qs or the, the spies or IWM for is uh, long term. So like uh, recently, I just put some money in there, right? I'm not going to touch that money for 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, so I use those as for part of my, my long term life that's not in my trading world. But I think it's just that that it's the trader in me is like I feel like I'll get more bang for the buck uh, going for individual names within those indexers or ETFs than I will with the, uh, the broader vehicle yeah great discussion so far guys real quick what we're going to do is more what are we going to give away we're giving away some 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 cool stuff today yeah we've got uh i've got it right here next to me in fact it's uh it's a thirteen hundred dollar gaming laptop um great great package uh it's an msi katana laptop uh it's about thirteen hundred dollars we're going to select three uh, winners for the one uh, laptop because you know there are some restrictions on sending electronics overseas and things like that so we want to be able to send it out uh, that's what we're doing we'll we'll do a random drawing live so people don't think we're uh, <laughs> picking favorites just sending uh, it to me yeah if Joe Fami's name me. comes up I know it's fixed <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if Joe wins we know it was rigged the, the, Funny, the, half the, the of the three finalists are Brian, Joe, and Anthony. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like you look in the, on the wheel. It's Joe F, Joe F A, Joe, Joe Brian A H. <laughs> Come on, baby. Yeah. All right, we're gonna take a quick sip of water back in thirty seconds for the drawing. Streamline your trading setup with Edge Clear, the forward-thinking broker for active traders. From our unbeatable service with an assigned broker to Edge Pro X, our robust and reliable trading platform. Edge Clear offers more than transparent fees and fair prices. Designed by traders for traders, we combine the best of technology, service, and risk control. Our dedicated brokers are here to help you grow. Join Edge Clear today and elevate your trading business.
All right, we're going to spin here to see who the winners are. And then next up, I'm going to be taking questions from the chat. I've already got about almost a dozen questions we're going to be getting to. So make sure you put your questions in chat and we will get to them. Morad, spin that wheel, man. There it goes. It'll pop up the name of the winner. The first, this is the, the main winner now. Oh, man, I thought at first I thought it said fam <laughs> or like wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to we're going to remove Ram. Run Good again, win, by the way. John's Doe saying, Deli, remember your Goombas. Brian. Brian, there you go. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were in here. And then the last pull. There it is, A. Andre. All right, and cool. Well, congrats, there it guys. Is. We'll reach. Please look for an email from EdgeClear on this, um, and we'll uh, arrange to have this shipped over to you. Yeah, so remember, every, everybody, every month, Morad uh, and EdgeClear is giving away a gift. you got to go to edgeclear.com slash deli to register and participate in it and we've had a lot of fun with it and it's it's just been really cool um some of the stuff we've given away now i want to go to some of the questions and i think it'll spark a discussion between all of us and we like i said we've got about a dozen so far like i said everybody they'll put your questions in uh and, and i will try to get to them today we want to hear from you and also comment throughout the discussion um the first one i want to go to i, I think this is interesting because we started off the show and this isn't really a question it's a comment from James. He says, finding what works for you is the hardest part, but it's because it takes so much time, but it is true. Got to find what works for you. Hard to piggyback off of others. And we started today's discussion, you know, it was Joe and Brian when they kicked it off and they were saying, you know, you know, it's, it's really going to come down to, to how you're trading. I mean, so we'll, maybe we'll go to you guys first. I mean, I mean, think about it. we got a lot of newer traders here, a lot of newer investors here, even though uh, some of them may have been doing it for a while, this is a difficult time and they maybe haven't figured out who they are. What maybe you guys tell us, what do you think is the best way for them to start figuring out who they are and what works for them? We'll go with you first, Joe. I mean, I always encourage people just to make a decision. Um, it, you, you have to make that decision. I agree with this question. You don't want to piggyback off of others because there's a great expression, borrowed conviction uh, rarely works. So you want to have your own conviction and your own style. It's going to depend. Like some people are trading in Europe. Some people are in Australia. Some people are in the Middle East. They're in different time zones trading the U.S. market. So that's a factor. If you're in the U.S., it's going to depend on are you working from home? Are you working full time where you can just peek in on the market? So that's also going to affect things where you might not be able to watch the market closely. But, uh, you know, so that way you'll have to change your time frame. So. I think there's a lot of variables, but at the end of the day, it comes down to one simple thing. Make these decisions on your own and don't let any other outside influences affect you. It just really comes down. Uh, you'll eventually have a sort of a gut feel of what works for you. Bri? So I'm going to give an answer that people are probably going to think is funny, but it, it's a serious answer. And I tell this to any uh, trader that's struggling, new, old, whatever, go to therapy. OK, <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, it is funny. It's there's some, funny there, it, it's funny and true. There's something about the market and the dynamics of the market that are able to zero in on your biggest insecurities and you don't realize it. And your trading may have something to do with the fact that you didn't get enough acknowledgement from your parents. <laughs> and you're trying to overcome that by proving to the market that you're smarter and uh Look, therapy in general is just good for people. Uh, today, you can do it over Zoom. But I think the other thing about going to therapy is that you get a third party, an, uninter an uninterested third party who will call you out on your bullshit, right? So yeah. much of what we try to do in our daily lives and the markets try to you know, convince ourselves that we're doing this right or we're doing that right. And you really need someone to say, nah, that's not working. So I would say, you know, get some positive feedback from someone. Uh, and therapy, I think, is one of the best ways to do it. We'll go to you, Morad. Morad, you've been helping people for years finding this out. I know all, all three of you guys are doing a tremendous job uh, at that. Morad, what is your message to people about that? Just to get back to Brian, I, my first, the first person I ever backed in my prop shop trading futures in high volume was a floor trader. And oh my God, the, uh, just the, the, uh, the, the absolute failure to get this person to accept trading 
two to three lots when they were doing 10 bigs in the pit. Uh, it was a total disaster. So I have, uh, I've pushed my traders to meditate, just to stay centered, to not, you know, we're, we're from childhood, we are just programmed to act on emotion. Like I feel this, I feel angry, punch something. Like uh, it takes a while for someone to learn. It takes a lot of gray hairs on your goatee to learn that, that uh, and maybe some lost hair to learn that you can have the emotion, but you don't actually have to do anything about it. You have to take just that little two second break and say, oh, okay, I recognize I'm feeling this. Uh, the market volatility bursts, you know, that, that uh, Fed day trade, which was a complete cluster for me, unusual that way. I could feel myself just be like, what? And you just have to be able to not click, get your hand off the mouse, and just relax. So Brian, definitely on point there to say that therapy is an incredible thing because there's a reason we do the things that we don't understand, which later when we look at our P&L or statements or what we did, we're like, why did I, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I keep doing it. Well, you're not addressing the issue that's beneath uh, that action, you know, and most of the time, if you just give yourself a second and not respond to the emotion as it pops up like a little child would, um, not that everybody's a child here, uh, I, I think over time you start to recognize that, oh, I, I don't need to act. It's okay. It's okay that I missed the number. It's okay that this or that happened or an amazing, you know, strong entry like Joe's talk. I missed it. I've been stalking it for weeks. I missed it. It's okay, I need to wait for my next setup because I'm a trader who follows his plan, you know, rather than somebody who's acting emotionally and FOMOing all over the market. Is the crazy ambulance out to get somebody there or what's I heard? Yeah. I couldn't it's figure out Chicago. where it was. Is it here or where is it? <laughs> it's behind it, me. It's it, Chicago. There are sirens going all okay. day long. It's a war zone. And Moran, I told you from the beginning, rule number one, we never talk about losing hair in trading. It freaks me out. Okay, we know that. <laughs> Next question. Says, says the guy with all the hair. Yeah, I, I get nervous. All right, this is a good question to talk. Maybe we'll start with Moran and maybe we'll work our way back this time. Question for the panel, please. Are big daily ranges in ES here to stay? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, I've been through several cycles. I started trading in twenty uh, in 2000, and I saw the, the, the airplanes colliding with the World Trade Center, what that did. I was trading equities and high volume then. I saw the, the correction that occurred in the housing market. Uh, I saw uh, the, the pullbacks, I and mean, it's been a rally since then, it seems. I've seen the pullbacks that came along for, you know, with Brexit and the China trade war and many other events, and it doesn't stay. It doesn't stay very long. The market goes in cycles you can almost plot them to a sine wave and and if you look at a volatility chart you know over a weekly you'll see how it spikes and it returns it spikes and it returns so look i traded through periods where we had nine points of range for the entire session that's the entire globex session for the s p 500 nine points on the day uh, and I also traded through some big corrections like the COVID, COVID crash and so on. It's just, I like where we are, to be honest with you. It is volatile. It can cool down a little bit. Like Brian, I really anticipated it being a lot higher in terms of the VIX. I expected it to be in the 40s, 45, something like that. Uh, but, but this is more than we normally get, and I expect it to slow down, and you just need to be aware and recognize that, uh, that this is happening and to pull in your targets and stops when that happens. So let's go to you now, Brian. What do, what do you see? So there's a human condition where we think that the time that we live in is always the most important time, and there's never been any time different than that, and that's doubly with traders. Traders always think that the time they're in is super unique. Uh, I took my first trade a month after I turned 18 in 1985. And two years later, I was right there when the stock market dropped 23% in one day. Okay. And I can tell you that when that happened, people thought that the world was ending. And we were, this was the new, the, the new normal, new paradigm. And of course, 
it wasn't. And, you know, we saw the dot com boom and bust, 9 11, you know, financial crisis, flash crash. And the, the market is in a constant state of discovery, right? Whenever there's these, um, these discrepancies in price and action, there's so many forces out there trying to find the edges that put those back in line. And th we're, that's just what we're doing right now. We're in that transition period. We'll go back to a time when volatility goes down, then sometime we'll go to a time when volatility goes back up and it will just continue until we all die. <laughs> it is, it's a never ending cycle. That's why right. we think it's gonna stay busy forever. And I think a mistake that so many traders make is, is that when it does get busy and you are doing well, it's hard to adjust back when things all of a sudden start to get slow again because now you're yeah. over anticipating too big of moves. And I'm that's sure the most, sure. that's the most dangerous time in the market for any traders that transition time when they don't recognize that you've gone from a bullish market to a bearish market. It's that in between time that really that's that's when people their careers end. 100%. I mean, you saw it from last year's style to this year, how everything was really on the bullish side. And you see how things have really turned bearish and buying the dip worked so well for so long, just, just stepping in and buying it because we recovered. And now this year it's punishing people for, you know, that type of strategy. That's not really what we do, right? Because we all have a real strategy behind what we, what we do, but you do see people have success in certain type of markets and transitions. And I'm guilty of this myself. I would say, you know, one of the most things I've talked about in the past is that when I've come off of my best runs or my best days or best weeks or best years, my worst year or my worst week or my worst day is quickly following that. It's kind of strange how that happens. 100%. But. Yep. So let's go to you, Joe, um, about this question. What do you think about range, uh, ranges? Are they here to stay for a while? I think to piggyback on what the other two guys said about recency bias, don't let what just happened, you know, we've had whatever, nine months this year of higher volatility ranges. Don't just assume it's going to be like that forever. Just like when we have those smooth up trends and everyone's making money and things are going well. And for the most part, the market's very accommodative and easier than other times. Don't think that's going to last. So you just have to, the key word is acceptance. You're going to have to accept that there are periods where the market corrects, we're going to have higher volatility um, and you're going to have to play a little bit more defense. And then there's periods where the market is in a boom or has priced in a lot of the negative news and you're going to do well. And, and, you know, just accept that there's different cycles of the markets. It's not always going to be bullish. It's not always going to be bearish, but don't let the recency bias affect you too much because just when you don't expect it, the market's going to price in a lot of the negative news and things are going to turn. And if you're stuck in that negative bear market mentality, when a new bull market emerges, you're going to have to adapt pretty quickly. Just to add to this, it's, it's amazing how it took me a while and it's amazing how few people recognize that today's news, today's known is already in yesterday's prices, that the market is betting on a probabilistic outcome that is into the future. You know, a pipeline gets blown up and, and uh, you know, the Nord Stream pipeline gets blown up. The, the response to that is immediate, but the real aftershock, the real impact on energy is really priced way, uh, way ahead. Uh, there are just some really smart people out there. Most people think, well, they watch CNBC and CNBC has a tendency unfortunately still today to explain today's move based on today's news and unless it's a surprise thing like the fed hiking in an accommodative cycle or something it's it's not really that simple it's stuff that's already happened and the market's already looked beyond it it's like chess three moves ahead type of thing all right let's work our way back again this time we'll start with joe this came up actually when you were talking about some stuff joe this is from craterhead um, are there any tricks to spotting non-chop volatility opportunities? Uh, just the simple thing is um, I just I've always talked about this in different talks I've given. Just use the 50 day moving average, whether you're trading a stock, whether you're trading an index. For the most part, just think of it simply as red light, green light when we're above the 50 day it's a green light to be in the markets and you're going to have more likely probability wise a lower volatility and lower chop environment 
when we're below that, it's usually in the market's in a correction and it's going to be a higher volatility. So I'll look at any stock. I'll look at futures. I'll look at any you know commodity chart, whatever. For the most part, above that 50 day is a lower volatility environment and below vice versa. What about you, Bri? No, I think Joe covered it there. I mean, you just you zoom out on your time frame. You use a, a longer term moving average and uh, just try not to get uh, try not to react to every single move, you know, have a little bit more of a macro approach. Yeah, Maura, you come in every morning. We talk about it. we're more in the shorter term, uh, you know, time frame. When you come into a day, how can you identify? What are some tricks to identify that it won't be choppy? Potentially, I guess, looking for what would be, you know, a trend type day. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with what Brian said earlier. You know, the market is a it's 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 discovering price every day, and that's a big, that's a that describes a good big portion of how I organize market information i mean if i come in and i find that the market is sitting in a what to everybody else on a bar chart looks like uh you know overlapping bars to me on the profile it looks like we're just we're really liking you know we've already in, incorporated all of the factors that impact the commodity that i'm trading be it crude or s p or whatever and we're sitting sideways through the, 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 the session, the overnight session, and we're sitting on this balance. I know that eventually we, we will have imbalance, we'll start moving. Uh, you know, the market just goes into that balance, imbalance, back to balance type of cycle. If we're in the middle of it, you know, I tell people, hey, you know, part of my broadcast, I say, look, where we are and given how the volume is overnight, and what we've accomplished overnight, you might want to keep your hands off the mouse for the, for at least the first half hour, the first hour maybe, because we're we haven't done anything. We haven't really moved away. You you have a market that is unchanged from yesterday's settlement. What are you going to do with that when you come in? There's nothing to do. So that's a very clear thing. If you have multiple days of that happening, uh, you have ATRs collapsing, things like that, uh, and and volume drying up. These are early indications that volatility is about to come out of the market. You need to adjust expectations for targets and stops in that situation. All right, because we've only got about seven, eight minutes left, I'm actually going to break down the questions individually on some of these, and maybe I'll include the whole panel. This one, more because we're with you, I'll stay with you real quick, because um, um, I think this is to you. Do you chart and follow ES, E-mini S&P open interest from Don? I, I don't. Uh, I, I pay attention during the roll, during the roll week. I want to see how much is left uh, before things resume back to normal. But to me, the ES open interest doesn't really describe anything other than, you know, maybe people are hedging, maybe they're not. Like it's impossible to know in the futures market because it's a hedge instrument. It's a capital efficient hedge instrument. To me, it, you just don't know what the intent is. So open interest rises. Does that mean we're accumulating? It doesn't. It just it, we might mean that there's a huge hedge going up before um, something takes place. So no, I don't. Yeah. And Larry Williams, one of the guys I first learned from, I mean, he said he never looks at stuff like that in the futures, you know. So anyway, just just some thoughts. We'll go back to um, we'll go to. So Flurry V, one of my guys, man, uh, he asked. Thoughts on stocks meta below multi-year lows, two beat up or value buys. And we'll go for we'll go with Joe and then maybe uh, and Brian too. What do you guys think about meta? Uh, you know, really quick. This is just an answer with any stock in a downtrend. That's a great company that's not going out of business, but growth is slowing and so forth. Two things: if you're gonna get into it, scale into it. Don't buy all at once. It's something I want to stress. A lot of people hesitate with making decisions because they have, let's say, 100 shares they want to buy. And then, oh, I should have bought it. Or they want to have 100 they want to sell. There's nothing wrong with starting with 25, whether it's on the in or out. But in this case, to scale into something, maybe start with 25, except that you might have to scale in a little bit more and buy a little bit more lower. And the second thing is because of the overhead resistance, you're going to have to be very, very patient for people who want to get out who bought at higher levels. So there's nothing wrong with that if your time frame is value and longer term. But scale in, understand you might have to buy lower and also accept it's going to take most likely a long time for it to come back. 
Bro, you been looking at that stock at all? Yeah, because it's a train wreck. Uh, I mean, it's below the, <laughs> the COVID lows. I think the key, Joe hit it right on the head. The key is that you have to reframe how you view this stock. It used to be a trading vehicle. It's not a trading vehicle currently. It could turn into a trading vehicle tomorrow. But if you're looking to do a, a long-term play in this, a, a value stock, what Joe said is right. The other th suggestion I would have is that, uh, you know, you're buying it, uh, scaling in. You can always write calls against it, right? Um, you can even write puts again. You could sell puts against it if you're willing to buy it lower. So that can bring your cost basis down if you have a longer term time frame. Morad, I'm going to go to you on this next one. Because um, I think this also came up on something that you were talking about. This is probably one I'll do for the whole panel. Um, it says, question, are there cycles in the economy? If so, what cycle are we in now? And when do you expect it to enter a new cycle? This is from Geo Capital. Absolutely, there are cycles. The market moves in fractals uh, on a tick chart all the way up to a weekly, monthly uh, chart. There are always cycles in the market. Uh, there are market regimes that are that are um, that are beneficial to Joe, then they're beneficial to the day trader, then they're beneficial to Brian, then they're beneficial to somebody else. It's, it's a, the, the key element here is to understand that this isn't mine and I need to keep my hands off the mouse. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to, to uh, narrow down. Uh, as far as what cycle we're in now, this is a, uh, a tightening cycle. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle where uh, liquidity is being pulled out of the market. Uh, we all know this. We've known about this for a long time. Uh, but I feel like the market has a pretty strong appetite for stocks still. They're looking to buy dips still from what I'm seeing on my charts and how I read this thing. I think we're in a tightening cycle, but that's not news to anybody. But uh, I believe Joe and, and Brian are much, much better suited to answer this in their time frame. Joe so, or Brian? You know, uh, to quote Jesse Livermore, I'll, I'll keep it simple. Um, don't overthink the macro stuff. Just uptrend or downtrend. Keep it simple. Uh, we're in a bear market correction, downtrend, whatever you want to call it. It's a cycle of the market. Just accept it. We're going to come out of it. Whether it's a bull market, cyclical bull, secular, this within a second, who cares? Just focus on uptrend, downtrend, and keep it simple. Uh, according to my 11th grade economics teacher, there are cycles. Um, I don't know which one we're going into next, but I will tell you this. It's really important for traders to separate what's going on in the economy from what's going on in their trading. And I think that one of the thing, one of the things I love to see is I love to see the market act really bullish when there's really bad economic news. Because like more I was saying, the market's discounting 24 months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever ahead of time. So when you see everybody panicking and when your brother-in-law calls you and freaks out, but the market is starting to move up, that might be a time to say, OK, I should be reevaluating what's going on and separating the fact that people are getting laid off or there's you know problems in the, gen the the main street economy from what's going on in the wall street world so i actually got questions that keep coming in we only got a couple minutes left so i'm trying to get quick questions or quick answers from you guys actually this one i think is just for for joe or brian i can't remember i don't think i'm you're... married if that's the question i'm married um, <laughs> you got right. girls ladies he's taken um this is from casper Zipkowski. I think I got that name right, Morad. I, I think oh, I, you know, that was pretty I good. I can't read. It was pretty good, right? I can't <laughs> read uh, names well. I'm terrible at this, but I think I got it. Uh, have you ever considered using constant volume bar chart instead of typical time chart? Did, did one of you guys talk about that? No. I have no idea what a constant volume I, bar chart is. I don't even know what is. that is. I couldn't tell you what that is. Jasper, I'm not sure if this is the right show. <laughs> it is. I'm sorry, buddy. All right. Um, let's go to – okay, so this one actually is mentioning Brian in the question. So I go to you, Brian. Uh-oh, trouble. Very hard. I know. Um, he wants to know what the T-shirt says. I can't read it. I'm trying to read it. But anyway. It says, that, it says uh, Mystery Pier Books. It's a, uh, it's a bookstore on Sunset in L.A. Do people go to bookstores still? I, so it's it's a it's a first edition. You can see from back here. I collect books, so it's first edition books. 
but yes, people do go to bookstores. <laughs> As, so Barry said, I would love to hear more about what Brian is saying. I often let my long-term account, 401k, et cetera, negatively affect my bias in my short-term time frame. Yeah, so I think if that's your problem, let someone else manage your, your long-term account. I mean, yeah. I have I have some stuff that I do myself in my long-term account, but like most people in this country, I have retirement accounts and I don't touch them, right? I have people that manage, you know, Fidelity, Schwab, whatever. And then that way it's out of sight, out of mind. You don't worry about it and you don't conflate it with what you're doing in your short-term time frame. This is kind of a funny one, Morad. Uh, this guy who says to you, he said, hi, I made 99% profit in two and a half months paper trading ES futures. Please can I have a funding for my live account profit split? <laughs> Call me. <laughs> Sold, sold to you. He's Bye. on Twitter. That's what it yeah, is. Come Thanks, back when you hit 100%. 99%. Yeah. 90, 99 Igor is blacker. 99%. <laughs> I brag about 99. Come on. I mean, right. really. Triple digits 100%. Then you maybe had something. Sorry. And then um, this one, just for anybody who wants to talk about this, do you guys are you guys looking at yields at the start of the day? I know I look at the two-year yield, the 10-year yield every morning. I want to see what they're doing because I think a lot of that is important. Anybody want to talk about yields? Are you looking at them? Not something I look at, no. The only no. yield I see is at the stop sign when I take my kids to school. <laughs> Thank you. Up? I'll be here all week. Thank Laura, you. do you look at yields at all? I just am not as smart as as Joe, so I don't, he, I don't look at it. He doesn't look at it, which makes me feel smart. So I don't look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't inform my setups or anything. All right, last question for the day. And we'll go with everybody around the horn. Um, we'll start with you, Brian. You've always been in the middle, but we're going to start with you. Um, where do you see the market by the end of 2022? Get that crystal ball out, Brian. At seven. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea where the market's going to go. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not in the prediction racket. If I was, I'd be on CNBC, you know selling my wares. So I, I really don't know where the market's going to go. All I can That's say, the question. <laughs> yeah. All I can <laughs> say is uh, we have a nice, you know, we have a nice uh, rally off of a, you know, a, maybe a potential to, uh, double bottom here. And uh, I'm going to look to see what happens after we get a pullback. You know, we get yeah. a, a pullback for a day or two. We'll see what happens. But I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, I'm going to switch the question a little bit because I think that something we can all kind of chime in about. I did a poll the other day on Twitter. After that, we had that big rally. I said, do you think that the low of the year is in? And 75% of the people said no, right? So it tells me that most people obviously don't believe in this. So I look at that and go, and I actually looked at that and I was a yes for that. You know, in my own poll, I was like, I actually believe that this is, could be the low of the year because when we open up a quarter, when we open up a month with strength like that, a lot of times it's hard to give back, and I do think that you know we, I'm not the Fed, you know, you know guy here, but I look at it and say I feel like the the worst could potentially be behind us. We talk about forecasting forward um, in markets, and so I think that it's it's at least a low for me as a trader. I can play off of. I don't know if it is. So I think more sideways to up is what I think than down from here. At least that's just kind of my two cents, just because of the action I've seen now, and that obviously could change. I, I think it's. I think it can be dangerous to think in those parameters. But playing along with this, the old school trader in me is suspect of the low because we did not see carnage. We did not see yeah. the VIX spike. We did not see panic in the streets. We did not see that proverbial blood. I always feel a lot more comfortable when I see that, and then I see a reversal. I'm not saying the bottom couldn't be in, but but you know I. I just don't feel we had enough pain to wash out those those final holdouts and those final sellers. Yeah, no capitulation. But I don't yeah, no capitulation. Yeah, this no almost capitulation. feels to me like, um, not that I'm thinking so macro out here, but my mind, the way I'm looking at the market, even though I am short term, is like I like this low to play off of. Could it get taken out? Would it kill me? No, I mean, it wouldn't change anything. But I feel like it's something that I look at in terms of more of a play. And it feels like that that 99 to 2000 time, or maybe it feels semi like a low is held in the next beginning of next year is when we have the capitulation. That's just in my mind working. Like I said, I'm a short term trader. I'm just saying openly the way I'm thinking. It doesn't mean it's right. I could change my mind tomorrow. Morad and uh, Joe will end with you two guys and your kind of thoughts on end of 22 is the low end kind of, you know, just fun stuff. Joe knows better. What do you think, Joe? <laughs> 
I kind of agree with you. A lot of people are recency bias being uh, very negative. I'll kind of answer the question this way. A great trait of traders is open-mindedness, flexibility. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones talks about adapt, evolve, or die. You have to adapt to what the market gives you. Uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, one of the best ever, says his greatest asset in the past 30 years is his ability to change his mind. So in other words, being flexible. I can't think of anything more flexible than David Tepper being short financials in 08, 09 and turning around and going long uh, in March, April of 09. So that's just a, an incredible three examples of three great traders that are very flexible. So my point is be open minded. We might have bottomed. Don't overthink the macro. Don't be affected by the recency bias. And if you're very bullish, be open minded. We could you know, see a little bit more downside. So just be flexible is the, is the best answer to that question. Yeah, so well said. Love that. Maura, we end with you today. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm looking at event contracts that settle today, let alone <laughs> at the end of the year. No, I, I, I don't think the Fed even knows. Like, that's a very, very hard thing. I mean, it's really a, um, it's a binary option. Hey, I was right. I said the low is in or, oh, I was wrong. Let's try this again in a year when you forget. What, I mean, that's the CNBC guest thing, you know. Yeah, exactly. I, I just think it's, there's so much going on with the Fed saying we'll beat the crap out of this market for as long as we need to to bring this inflation down the the job market's still tight based on that jolts number yesterday i mean that's all macro stuff but to me it's like just just let's let's get through this week okay let's just figure out what's, what's happening this week <laughs> yeah everybody and that's why you got to stay tuned joe you do your spaces all the time i highly recommend everybody goes there and watches though or actually listens to those well, brian's my great. secret weapon on the spaces yeah, so. it's, yeah uh, brian's a stud and the loon, or the loon, I'll go back to loon, the Lund report. Sorry, Brian, we're not in Sweden. Lund, Lund loop, Lund, Lund loop. loop. Worst name ever in the history of names. But <laughs> And of course, everybody follow these guys on Twitter. Quickly go around the horn. Uh, but first, I'm going to plug Edgeclear. Make sure you follow Edgeclear on Twitter, sponsor of this show. Um, fantastic guys over there. And also go to edgeclear.com slash deli to participate in the giveaway next month. Stay tuned to see what that is. More at work for people follow you on Twitter. Twitter, uh, twitter.com forward slash futures trader 71. And of course, if you day trade or looking to day trade, be it stocks or futures, uh, I'm on at 9 a.m. every day on a live stream telling you basically just showing you my homework every morning. Yeah. Joe, Twitter, website. Um, yeah, Twitter uh, at Jay Fami, first initial, last name, joefami.com. Um, you know, I try to blog when I can have an educational product if anyone wants to check it out. But, you know, like I said, just stay open minded and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Bry. Yeah. So Twitter, it's uh, at BC Lund. And then I've got the Lund Loop, which is a newsletter. But more than that, it's a, it's a community. It's a community of uh, active investors and traders uh, really dedicated to helping everybody raise their game. I always say that we're the anti fin twit. Uh, so, you know, Check out my Twitter handle. You can find a link to it there. Yeah, you guys one are thing great. That was, one thing what was that, that was asked, Anthony, that we didn't answer. Somebody asked if your Discord, which you mentioned earlier, is a subscription service or if you if there's a way to qualify to get on there to see what's going on. Brian. Mine? So yes. when you when you subscribe to the Lundloop newsletter, you get access to the Discord. So it is it's uh, and it's by design because I don't want a holes in there. Seriously, I don't want <laughs> I don't want that toxic stuff that's in Twitter. And if someone is an a hole, I kick them right out. So yeah, very cool. Good that's guys. Why, that's why he kicked me out. <laughs> that's yeah. why Joe's not in there. That's why he's doing spaces now. <laughs> You guys were awesome. Thank you so much for your time. You guys answered all the questions, pretty much all the questions out there. And thank you, everybody in the audience that participated like we do every week here on Futures Radio Show. Guys, have a great rest of your day. Everybody else, we're done. I will see you guys next week. See you, everybody. See ya. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests 
and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Future's radio show is produced by Crudelli Productions.